So I've been uh, exploring here at the church, and one of the things that was kind of a, kind of exciting for me was a, a find of a treasure that I found. I found um, plans, and some of these are the blueprints uh, and the, the elevations and all for the plans from from June of 1985 when we built the new wing on the church. That's kind of exciting. Even, even more fun for me was I found, um, I found some plans, some of the house plans for the parsonage that was w built back in 1958 is what the dates are there. I found those in a, in a cupboard here. <laughs> it's, I just love blueprints. I like plans. I, I, I love going through blueprints and floor plans and but, you know, not just visual plans. I like the idea of a plan to see the different elements of a strategy come together and, and fit like a, a puzzle piece together. I, I mean, there's something, there's something about a plan that is comforting. I mean, a plan means that, that what's, what you're looking forward to is more than just wishful thinking. It, it means that some effort has gone into moving a dream from a dream to actual reality. Uh, there, there's imagination involved, yeah, and there's hope involved, and there's expectation. A and it means that there might even be more than one person involved with this vision. You see, the world that we live in, well, the world that we know, it's not very much like the world we think that God would like to see. A world of peace and justice and mercy. And, you know, we don't see a lot of evidence that that could ever change. Oh, yeah, we can hope. But isn't that just wishful thinking? I mean, there are even folks that consider faith to be an escapist fantasy, just pie in the sky dreaming. Well, you know, there's a kind of hope that is wishful thinking, but there's also a kind of hope that is built on expectation. And so how do we know which is which? Well, I think it has something to do with having a plan. And what if God has a plan for our world? Well, we're going to talk about that in just a few minutes. I'm Jack Starr, and I want to welcome you to this February 28th service of the United Methodist Church of Osceola, Wisconsin. Lord, I lift your name on high. You came from heaven to earth to show the way From the earth to the cross, my debt to pay From the cross to the grave, from the grave to the sky Lord, I lift your name on high Lord, I lift your name on high I love to sing your praises. I'm so glad you're in my life. I'm so glad you came to save us. You came from heaven to earth to show the way from the earth to the cross. My debt to pay from the cross to the grave. From the grave to the sky, Lord, I lift your name on high. Lord, I lift your name on high. Lord, I lift your name on high. Amen and welcome. It is good to have you with us this morning. Thank you for joining us today. Why don't we join right away with our call of worship and our centering prayer. And you can find those words up on the screen in front of you. I invite you to say them out loud with me. Eternal God, in our joy and our sorrow, 
You see us and call us to you. We open our hearts to you. Guide our thoughts and awaken us to your spirit. Help us to realize and embrace the joy that we find in your presence. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's join in singing that great old hymn of outreach and evangelism. We have a story to tell to the nations. It is in our United Methodist hymnal number 569, but you can read along um, with the words that are here on the screen. Invite you to join in singing with us. We've a story to tell to the nations That shall turn their hearts to the right A story of truth and mercy A story of peace and light A story of peace and light For the darkness shall turn to dawning and the dawning to noonday bright and christ's great kingdom shall come on earth the kingdom of love and light we've a song to be sung to the nations that shall lift their hearts to the lord a song that shall conquer evil and shatter the spear and sword and shatter the spear and sword for the darkness shall turn to dawning and the dawning to noonday bright and christ's great kingdom shall come on earth the kingdom of love and light We've a message to give to the nation That the Lord who reigns up above Has sent us His Son to save us And show us that God is love And show us that God is love For the darkness shall turn to dawning and the dawning to noonday bright and christ's great kingdom shall come on earth the kingdom of love and light we've a savior to show to the nations who the path of sorrow has trod that all of the world's great peoples might come to the truth of god might come to the truth of god for the darkness shall turn to dawning and the dawning to noonday bright and christ's great kingdom shall come on earth the kingdom of love and life oh amen isn't that song great there's a song of expectation and hope and of planning and that phrase the darkness will turn to dawning the dawning to noonday bright. Oh, let that be our prayer of that kingdom to come on earth. Um, actually, that, that phrase is in our prayer, prayer that we will be um, praying together in just a minute. But before we get to the Lord's Prayer, we're going to, we're going to join our hearts together in praying for well, ourselves, but also our neighbors and our friends and our loved ones. Um, I invite you to remember our church family as you pray. And uh, I invite you to remember some neighbors. I invite you to remember your loved ones, but also fix in your mind the, the face, the name of someone 
who you feel needs a particular blessing, let's pray for God's blessing upon them on this day. So let us join together in prayer. You'll hear me pray out a, a sort of a category, and I invite you to, to think in your heart, in your minds of some folks that you want to lift up individually, and then I'll say, Lord, in your love, hear this our prayer, and we'll all join together in praying that. Let us pray. Gracious God, thank you for the opportunity to pray. Thank you that it means drawing near to you. And we thank you that we get a chance to pray whenever we want to. You invite us to do that, that you are always open and that we can come to you anytime, night or day, in any sort of form. It's just opening up our hearts and our minds and connecting with you. Thank you for this opportunity as, as we are gathered together that there are many of us who can lift up our prayers together. And, and when we share a prayer that that we can realize that there are many others who are, um, are uniting their hearts with our prayer as well. And so this morning, Lord, we bring these prayers to you. Lord, we pray today for all who have suffered loss, some loss of belonging, some loss of certainty, some, some loss of hope, some, Lord, who have suffered losses of loved ones, and we lift them up to you, all who have suffered loss. Lord, in your love, hear this, our prayer. We pray, Lord, for those who have died and for those who are in the process of dying. We pray for those who have lost loved ones who have died. And, and we pray for your comfort and your peace and your hope and your strength. And that all those who are missing loved ones will remember your great promise of your love and a reunion one day. Lord, in your love, hear this our prayer. We pray, Lord, for those who are ill. There are many who are ill, Lord, and as we're still in the throes of a pandemic. We keep hearing of friends and loved ones who are ill with that. And, and then we hear of those who have other conditions, a lung disease, heart disease, cancer. There are many reasons that people are ill and we pray, Lord, for healing. We pray for hope. We pray, Lord, for those who are ill, not just physically, but emotionally, mentally. We pray for your healing. Lord, in your love, hear this, our prayer. We pray for those who are facing uncertainty. It may be in their work situation. It may be in their living conditions. It may be uh, it may be because of an uncertain future. Something is changing for them. And we lift up those that uncertainty will not overwhelm them, will not defeat them, that, but that they might continue to have trust in you. So for all those facing uncertainty, Lord, in your love, hear this our prayer. We pray for all who suffer, those who are in danger of fire and flood and famine, of, of storm, of, of natural disasters, those who are victims of violence, and those who have lost homes. There are many who suffer around our world, Lord, and we lift them all up to you. We pray for your strength, your peace, your protection over all who suffer. Lord, in your love, hear this our prayer. We pray, Lord, for our leaders, leaders of government and of industry, of corporations and of institutions, leader of, leaders of organizations 
and of movements. Lord, there are many people who influence and shape the world we live in. And we pray for wisdom, we pray for protection, we pray for grace and compassion. All of that, Lord, that you can bestow on these leaders. We pray, Lord, for our leaders. Lord, in your love, hear this our prayer. And Lord, we pray for all who serve. There are so many, Lord, who serve their neighbors, their friends and loved ones, and, and all of us. They're serving in the police, in the fire departments, and as EMTs, they are serving in the military. They are serving in um, capacities uh, that provide assistance for others. They're serving at food shelves. They are serving at shelters. They are serving in medical facilities and in long-term care facilities. There are so many others who care for others. And we give you thanks for them and we pray for your strength. We pray for your grace. We pray, Lord, that they will be blessed in their care of their neighbors. Lord, we pray for all who serve. Lord, in your love, hear this our prayer. And then, Lord, for your church. We pray for your church. Um, your people who are around the world, and they are often in these circumstances where they are there to be able to provide grace and blessing to their neighbors. We pray, Lord, that you will empower your church to live out your vision to live out who you are in the presence of their neighbors and many of them lord are struggling because they're doing that pour out your blessing on your church lord and renew and restore them our church here lord we pray that you will bless us in a way that we can be a blessing to others and keep us moving in that direction lord so that we might reflect you to our neighbors Lord, we pray for your church. Lord, in your love, hear this our prayer. Oh, thank you, God, for, for hearing our prayers. And thank you, God, that, that you go beyond just what we may voice. You see and hear and know what is in our hearts. But beyond that, you know, Lord, what we have forgotten. And we are a forgetful people, Lord. We forget our neighbors who are in need. And Lord, we even forget you. And we thank you, Lord, that, that you have grace and patience for us um, as we do that. And so we, we covet, Lord, the way that you fill in our prayers to complete them and make them be full. Thank you, Lord, that when we pray, it means that we are in communion with you. And that we are really drawing near to you. And so we pray that that will renew us, that that will, uh, that that will inspire us, that that will fill up our tanks so that we might be ambassadors for you in our world. That we might be witnesses, that we might testify according to you, that, that our very lives will be a witness to who you are. So that all might know your grace and your goodness. We pray this in the name of our Lord Jesus, our Lord who taught us how to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. We've been talking about faith and doubt over the last few weeks. Uh, I've suggested that instead of being the opposite of faith, doubt is actually a necessary part of our faith journey. And that it can actually be a building block to make our faith stronger. 
You see, faith is less about believing something than it is about having a relationship with someone. Uh, It's about trust when you can't be absolutely certain about something. Well, last week we were talking about having faith in an impossible situation, uh, a situation that you find yourself in that is simply unfixable. So does faith go off the deep end in that kind of situation? Uh, Does it become irrational or crazy? Is, Is our hope just something random? Or is there some kind of plan? A plan. Uh, does anybody remember back, I, back in the 80s, a, a series called The A-Team? You remember The A-Team? It introduced us to Mr. T, who, who gave a whole new meaning to military uniforms. Uh, yeah, so The A-Team, it was a, a uh, U.S. Special Forces unit that was court-martialed for some crime that they didn't commit because they always they, they never commit the crimes that they're in prison for. Anyway, this, this team escapes from prison, and then while they're trying to clear their name and while they're on their run, they work as soldiers of fortune. So the leader of the A-team is the cigar-chewing Colonel Hannibal Smith, who's played by George Pappard. And his catchphrase, which, which you'd hear every at some time in every show, was, I love it when a plan comes together. <laughs> well, I do too, and especially this plan. I'm reading from Ephesians 1, verses 9 and 10. God did what he had purposed, and he made known to us the secret plan he had already decided to complete by means of Christ. This plan, which God will complete when the time is right, is to bring all creation together, everything in heaven and on earth, with Christ as the head. Or, or in the New Living Translation, I'll repeat that passage in New Living. God has now revealed to us his mysterious will regarding Christ. Which is, to fill, which is to fulfill his own good plan. And this is the plan, that at the right time, he will bring everything together under the authority of Christ, everything on heaven and on earth. You see, the Apostle Paul is talking about a plan. And he talks about this plan in one form or another in a lot of different places in his writings. Let's look at Colossians. Uh, and and doesn't so much mention the plan as, as it gives an element of it. Colossians 1, verses 15 through 20. The Son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have the supremacy. For God was pleased to have all of his his fullness dwell in him, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, making peace through his blood shed on the cross. There is that's there's that sense that plan is described again. And so let's look at what Paul says in his letter to the Philippians, Philippians 4, verses 4 through 9. Rejoice in the Lord always, he says, and I will say it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all, for the Lord is near. Don't be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God, and the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or or seen in me, put it into practice and the God of peace will be with you. Okay, can you get a little sense of what is going on here? There are bits and pieces of this plan all over the place in the New Testament. And it just seems to me in Ephesians that Paul kind of comes right out and says what he's doing. So so first, 
a, a little bit of background on what we're thinking. Everyone has faith. Okay, that's an assumption that I'm making here. It, it's not a religion thing, it's a human thing. We, we have all, from time to time, had to take some action on things about which we're not certain. So faith isn't trying to make yourself believe something like the cowardly line in The Wizard of Oz, I do believe, I do believe, I do believe. Um, it, it's not trying to make ourselves psychologically certain about something which we have doubts on. Faith, faith is more of a pledge, um, a pledge of trust and trustworthiness. It's more of about making a commitment or, or establishing a covenant. Um, in fact, faith is probably more like a marriage. Faith, faith is, is like the I do at the altar in a marriage, when two people pledge their lives to one another. You know, you find a whole lot of marriage imagery in the New Testament. Well, at its heart, faith is describing that kind of relationship with Jesus Christ. It, it's trusting in him, even though you don't see all the details, you don't see the future. You see, in Christianity, the center of our faith is not doctrine. And you know what? It's not a book, even if that book is the Bible. That's not the center of our faith. The center of our faith is a person, the person of Jesus Christ. Now, we embrace the Bible for sure, because the Bible is the story of Jesus. But that's not what our faith is. That's not where our faith is. It's in Jesus himself. And that's exactly what these passages are saying, that Jesus is the center of the center of the plan. You see, in Colossians 1.17, we read, In him all things hold together. And, and our relationship with Jesus is actually what connects us to the plan. And so that brings us back to the marriage metaphor. Um, when two people are thinking about saying, I do, they get inside each other's head. They, they spend as much time as possible together. And when they're not together, they think about each other when they're apart. They dream dreams. They have visions. They run previews of what life will be like in their heads. You know, movies with happy ever after endings. And that encourages them and it motivates them and it, and it moves them toward the I do at the altar. There's a lot of imagination at play here and faith is all about imagination. You see, happily married couples keep the seat, uh, keep this whole thing up even after they're married, after they say, I do. Happily married people, well, they think about each other at least part of the time. They, they remember times together and they think about what the other might be doing right now. And, and they think about what they will be doing together at some time in the future. You see, they're still running movies in their brains. That's, that's doing faith in a good marriage. Your lives are actually interwoven in your imagination. You're anticipating, you're trusting, you're acting on it. And that's what it is to have faith in a good marriage. People who are in an unhealthy and an unhappy marriage are also running movies. But these movies aren't so positive. In these movies, the story is all about the hurts and the bitterness and the negative. They remember and they anticipate more of the same negatives. And they feed on those feelings and those feedings, those feelings feed on them. I mean, why do disagreements and fights seem to, seem to happen so easily? Well, it's because they've been rehearsing for it all day long. See, people in unhappy marriages... Well, they have faith too, but their faith is in everything that's bad in their relationship. So, so the movies that you run in your head, well, the reality that you anticipate, the stories that, they, that you tell yourself, in, in other words, your imagination, that does a whole lot to determine the kind of life that you're going to live. The quality of your life and of your relationships is determined mostly by the kind of faith that you have for it. That, that leads us right into another important element of the plan. See, our faith is guided by what we think about 
and how we think about it. Now, we're not taught to do this in our culture, and unfortunately, we're not usually taught to do this by the church. But it's really vital to pay attention to it. We've got to think about what we think about, and the problem is that we usually don't. I, I tend to be a, a kind of go-with-the-flow kind of guy. You know, it is what it is, and so you deal with that. But sometimes that can lead us in a bad direction. I mean, culture, what we see all around us, can become the default for what we think about in our brains. So the question, what kind of movies are you running in your head? That, that determines the kind of faith that's in your head. So how do you think about your neighbor? Uh, what do you think about the people that you work with? Uh, how do you think about your spouse or your children? Now, this is not something we want to leave up to a faceless, uncaring society. If we are not intentional about how we employ our minds, then we just breathe in the pollution of our world, and that becomes our default. We anticipate the wrong things, and then our life doesn't line up with God's story. And that's why Paul, when he's talking to the Philippians, he, he says that, that part of that I just read in 4.8, Fill your minds with those things that are good and that deserve praise. Things that are true, noble, right, pure, lovely, and honorable. I, I think I probably changed the version. I think I was just using the good news version of Philippians 4.8 um, um, in the Good News Bible. But it's interesting that the fact that the Bible tells us what to think about suggests that we actually have some power, some control over what we think about. It means that we can make some choices, actually, about our faith. See, what Paul is saying is he's saying, okay, download that, install that, those good things, those noble things, those right, pure, lovely, honorable things. Run movies on that in our brain. Have the vision that looks like that. And if it's not good, if it's not true, if it's not honorable or noble or right or pure or lovely, if it doesn't align with God's word and God's, God's vision for the world, then press the delete button. Get rid of it. You don't need to have that kind of pollution going on in your brain. Now, now, we can imagine, and sometimes when we hear this passage, we think of the most notable things. You know, it's saying we, we can all think of things that we're supposed to delete. Um, gratuitous violence, gratuitous sex, gratuitous gore, and so on and so on. But what about gratuitous selfishness? I mean, there are all kinds of movies that we run in our brains. And, and there are some movies in, in which we are the hero who is always right. And we are surrounded by those who aren't. We're surrounded by kids who are annoying and spouses who don't get it, by bosses who are vindictive and, um, and colleagues that are incompetent and strangers, oh, strangers who always have hostile intentions. And we're quick to run these movies um, in which, well, in which the end justifies the means. And if we can imagine it in those movies, if we can put our faith in it, we then can direct our lives in that direction. And is that what we want to choose, those kind of movies? I mean, more than anything else, this is going to determine the quality of our life. It's going to determine the quality of our relationships. And it's going to determine how the kingdom of God plays out in our lives. We've got to take all of that captive for Jesus Christ. Because it begins with the stories that we tell ourselves and the movies that we run in our heads. And that's why Paul says that. It's so important what Paul says to us. Faith is about the story that we live in. It's about the narrative that goes on in our heads. Because, you see, the world doesn't interpret itself. We interpret it. We interpret it through our grid, through our own perceptions that's our story we ascribe meanings to things it can be a true meaning 
or it can be a false meaning. But the Bible gives us guidelines about what is true. And our job is to live up to that story. You see, Jesus is giving us a plan, is telling us a story, a kingdom story. And the climax of that kingdom story is the victory of Jesus Christ. Jesus wins in the end. The story that we are in is a happy ever after story. A story that we just need to say yes to and that we need to align ourselves to. And so what do we do about that? Well, we already know enough about this plan to act on it. We have been let in on it by Scripture. The secret plan, it's not a secret anymore. The, the good news of the Ephesians, um, the Ephesians 1 passage that I read earlier, reads a, a little bit different, but, but it emphasizes some words I want to lift out. Um, here, God did what he had purposed. And he made known to us the secret plan, which he had already decided to complete by means of Christ. This plan, which God will complete when the time is right, is to bring all creation together, everything in heaven and on earth, with Christ as the head. You see, the essence of our faith is the I do. We say, I do, to Jesus. Uh, we make that commitment as we imaginatively weave our lives into his. Well, this is at the core of it. It is trusting in the promise that a time is coming when everything will be integrated into Christ as the head, united into Christ, the common denominator of everything that exists. The love of Jesus Christ is already like a thread that is woven through every bit of reality. And when the story is done, the unending last chapter is that everything has found harmony in Jesus. Everything and everyone is reconciled and integrated in Jesus. But the truth is that we don't observe a whole lot of reconciliation, a whole lot of integration and unity around us right now. In fact, disintegration is the way of our world. You know, in the A-team, when we see Hannibal Smith grinning and chewing on his cigar and saying that line, I just love it when a plan comes together. Usually there are explosions and destruction and disintegration going on behind him. Well, in our world, Disintegration doesn't need the A-team to make it happen. I mean, it's all around us. Everywhere we look, it seems like chaos and disorder. It seems like they reign around us. And it can be difficult to imagine the world that Christ promises. It's easy to anticipate bad outcomes. And, well, it is hard to have faith. We battle the discouragement by doing what loving couples in a healthy marriage do. Remember the promise. So we remember the promise of Christ's victory, and we run that story in our heads. If we dream of the future that Jesus has promised, and we live our lives according to what that promise looks like, well, then faith remains alive in us. And so in the end, well, we know the end of the story. We know that one day this world will be fully integrated into the story of Jesus. We'll be reconciled with it, united with it. Now, we don't pretend that this world is, is already integrated, but we won't give up on the expectation that the kingdom echoes. We can see just a little bit of the plan coming together here and coming together there. And in our everyday actions, we need to exhibit the imaginative faith of the future that God has called us to live in and to present today. We tell ourselves that story. We play those movies. We, we pull all of the good and truthful and the right and the pure and the honorable things of the future dream into the world today, into the lives that we live today. And we can do it through imagining 
what the future story of Jesus looks like. How can we do it? We can do it because we know the plan. It is coming together. The plan of all things being reconciled, integrated, and unified in Jesus Christ. Amen. Let's join in singing together in, in that hymn. It's, it might be fairly new for you. It was fairly new for me not that long ago called The Summons. It's in the faith we sing number 2130, but you can look at the words on your screen. Will you come and follow me if I but called your name? Will you go where you don't know and never be the same? Will you let my love be shown? Will you let my name be known? Will you let my life be grown in you and you in me? Will you leave yourself behind if I but call your name? Will you care for cruel and kind and never be the same? Will you risk the hostile stare? Should your life attract or scare? Will you let me answer prayer in you and you in? Will you let the blinded see if I but call your name? Will you set the prisoners free and never be the same? Will you kiss the leper clean and do such as this unseen? And admit to what I mean in you and you in me. Lord, your summons echoes true when you but call my name. Let me turn and follow you and never be the same. In your company I'll go where your love and footsteps show thus i'll move and live and grow in you and you in me amen isn't that great right there in the song we're reflecting what jesus tells us his mission is and it reflects his invitation to us to be part of his kingdom mission on this earth. And, and the last verse, a verse of commitment saying, yes, I'm going to buy into that. Well, we want to give you thanks for buying into that, buying into that mission. And we want to give you thanks for being a part of that mission as we try to practice it here at Osceola United Methodist. And Many of you are doing that by helping to support the ministry, and we give you thanks for the gifts and the offerings that you have, have already um, provided to support our work. And, and so I want to pray this prayer of dedication for these gifts, and I invite you to pray the prayer with me. Let us join. Lord God, you share your glory with us, giving us comfort and hope in your Son, Jesus Christ. In gratitude and thanks, we offer you our hearts, our lives, and all that we have. May our gifts and offerings be an answer to your call to free the trapped, heal the broken, and show your good news to the poor and helpless. Bless our lives that we may shine with your glory and light up the world with your love. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Just a few announcements before we end today. I hope you've received 
online. You should have received online. We've emailed it to you. Some of you, it may not have arrived yet. We had a couple of things that, that delayed our getting out the snail mail. And so if you haven't received this yet, you should be receiving it shortly, your newsletter for the week. Um, and, and there are a couple of things I want to lift up in there. Uh, one of the first is that on Wednesday, well, this week, we're into March. On Wednesday, it's the first Wednesday of the month, but we do not have a council meeting this Wednesday. That will be next Tuesday. This Wednesday in the evening, we're having another one of our Lenten services. And while I'm, while I'm on that, I want to invite you to join us at 7 o'clock for a podcast. We're looking at the Lord's Prayer. And, and this week, we're looking at the phrase, give us this day our daily bread, and talking a little bit about what we might mean, all the things that we might mean by that. But that's happening at 7 o'clock. At 7.30, I would love for you to join us on Zoom for a, uh, for a discussion and a study of what we've just talked about, of, of the passage that we talked about. We, as a matter of fact, if you are up to it, you might actually be able to join us at church because here in the fellowship hall, we are having some me some folks that are gathering and we're gathering safely with distance and masks and all that, but we're being part of that podcast. So you can join us here in person or you can join us online on the Zoom meeting. So, so whether you're here or join us online, it has been really meaningful. In fact, um, we had some great questions that moved us forward. I think during our Zoom part of uh, the discussion, we move forward, uh, we move farther than we did during the pad podcast because of the contributions that people made. We're getting better at that every week. And so invite you to join us and see what we're doing in that Bible study. Uh, there are some other things I'm going to let you see what's, uh, look at what is, what is on there. Uh, next week, while we're talking about the schedule, next week it's the first Sunday of the month and we are going to celebrate communion on that Sunday. We aren't providing any elements for you, so I invite you to gather them at home. And we will be praying the blessing uh, during the service, um, a blessing on those elements as you join for our service of communion. So find a, a beverage to drink, find some bread, something um, uh, some grain of the earth that we might uh, that we, we might be able to use in our service next Sunday. In the meantime, I invite you to look through the newsletter about some of the things that are going on inside. There's a whole page on our mission activity, and there are some really important missions that we are involved with now. One of them is interfaith caregivers that is local in our county and uh, who are providing assistance to people who need to make appointments and connections and have some services in so that they can live full lives. But another one is that we are sending some funds, we are collecting funds to send to the General Board of Global Missions, in particular for an agricultural center in Zambia. And, and this is something that is doing wonderful work for the people of Zambia. And, and it's showing God's love and it's inviting people to be a part of the kingdom of Jesus' kingdom here on earth. And so you can look at that on the second page of our newsletter. And then we've also got new word, uh, just received word about this year's in-gathering. And so in the newsletter, there are some ideas of what we might begin to collect. We have a bin in the entryway of the church where we can start making some collections for our in-gathering. So those are just some of the things I want to lift up to you that's in the newsletter. Invite you every day, please keep praying for your church. And I don't just mean us, though we truly covet your prayers. Um, pray for the United Methodist Church. Pray for the churches of our community that we might continue to reflect God's grace and love in everything we do. And I challenge you, make your lives about reflecting it as well. So will you join me in the benediction now? And now may the grace of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, may the love of God, our eternal Father, and may the presence of the Holy Spirit be with us all.
now and forever. Amen. Let's sing Let There Be Peace on Earth in response. Let there be peace on earth and let it begin with me. Let there be peace on earth, the peace that was meant to be. With God our Creator, children all are we. Let us walk with each other in perfect harmony. Let peace begin with me. Let this be the moment now. With every step I take, let this be my solemn vow. To take each moment and live each moment in peace eternally. Let there be peace on earth and let it be. And in the name of the resurrected Christ, all God's people said, Amen. God bless you this week, folks.